for those who don't know, this is Jarrett Carpenter, the host of More Than Blockchain, which I was interviewed on before it was More Than Blockchain. And I'll tell you what, I like a lot of what you do, Jarrett, but I'll tell you what I like best, your silky voice, your last, your last micropod I listened to, and you had written it out. It was so well done. And I was like, this guy's voice is on point. It was awesome. So give everyone like the synopsis of more than blockchain real quick. And then I'm going to give the topic that you and I started and I want to finish if that's okay uh, on the phone the other day. But what's the, what's the summary of more than blockchain for, for the audience? Yeah, for sure. And, and Grant, it's great to, great to be here. I've, I've been following your stuff since even before I knew you. I mean, that's how I had you on more than blockchain. I saw you on YouTube and I was creeping and I was like, oh, oh who's was, this dude? I was oh. to remember. <laughs> yeah, it was more than, it was, uh, it was on YouTube. You were talking about uh, Wonderland. And yeah. I had just gotten in and I was trying to get the down low and you're very, very much have your hand on the pulse, your finger on the pulse, and you still do on DeFi and NFTs and a lot of other stuff in Web3. So more than blockchain, what is more than blockchain about? More than blockchain is the second iteration of a podcast I started actually called Wi-Fi and Water. That's right. And Wi-Fi and Water, yeah, went into basically focusing on two things, which I think are going to continue to shape our world. As we are both people who live in coastal states, the climate the climate change, climate crisis, whatever you want to call it, climate and cryptocurrency. Yeah. And so it was my birthday actually. And it was Jay Harris. We had talked about how he had just basically rebranded his podcast and why he did that. Mm. And I was feeling like I had my hit my foot in two different worlds and I needed to choose. And I think the more you focus your content, the more you focus mm -hmm. your intentional vision, yeah. the more likely you are to compound. And that will kind of you know, lead into, I think what we're going to talk in the second half of this, but yeah, more than blockchain is really my exploration of NFTs, DeFi, cryptocurrency, blockchain, mm. the metaverse, web three, all of these things, DAOs, all of these really fun things that are coming up right now. And really the progression of technology, the progression of tech. I was actually talking to somebody the other day and I, instead of saying, oh, I run a blockchain podcast, because I think that that can be really off-putting to somebody. Yes. I went even higher level and I said, no, I run a technology podcast. And then what do you focus on? Yeah, what do you focus on? I focus on blockchain. And so that seemed to allow the person to, to maybe make it a little bit more palpable, if that makes mm -hmm. sense, by sent, by calling it a tech podcast. So yeah, and that's that's what I'm doing with more than so blockchain. Question, I didn't realize, we've talked about that before and I, I appreciate you refreshing that, but Wi-Fi and water, and for those who don't know, for those who have been following me for a while, they know that I've done a lot of humanitarian and development work throughout the world. And, and I think we shared some immediate rapport because of your work in Colombia and your compassion for bringing technology, aka in this case, DeFi, to uh, rural, local, average Colombia and helping them enter an equal playing field in a finance space with some of the challenges of the narco state of Colombia. And I love those nuances, super fun. You didn't say, or I didn't catch this last time where you were trying to pick, I got to pick, you know, these climate issues and these, and these true humanitarian issues versus tech. Why did you end up on the tech side of that? Because I am too. Yeah, I, that's a great, like, I think about this a lot. And I actually had this conversation with somebody else. And if you go on to more than blockchain and you want to hear me talk more about this at length, episode 14, and I call episode it the last 14. episode. Yeah, episode last episode 14, I believe. It's the last episode of Wi-Fi and Water, and it's the first episode of More Than Blockchain. But it really comes down to an energy thing. Talking about climate is exceedingly depressing. We kind of know <laughs> what's going to happen, yeah. and we're not exactly excited about what's going to happen. It doesn't matter where you are, you're experiencing this. Either it's too hot, either it's too cold, you're running into water shortages, there's too much wind. This is all happening. You know, the mm. things in the coast that I think we worry about is erosion, but what's actually happening where I am in Massachusetts is it's just so freaking windy all the time. And people are having to take trees down, which is the last thing we want to do in a heating atmosphere, in an atmosphere that, that's heating up, is to take trees down because we know that they help to cool the earth. So mm -hmm. it was that. It was just, I was feeling like eco depression. You know, I think when you think about the climate crisis, you get into an existential thing. I mean, it's why millennials, mm -hmm. and we're going to get into investing and talking about a longer term view, but it's why millennials are just like, okay, I've got inflation. 
Yeah. The housing prices are through the roof. My job, my, you know, my, my wages have been stagnant for basically my whole life. And you're telling me the climate is just going to like go. Yeah. I'm not going to invest. I'm going to take the other side of YOLO, which is not the long term. It's the short term. It's the I champagne. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's the clubs. So but then when I think about me thinking about cryptocurrency and all the conversations I have and the people I've met like you, yeah, it's a lot more of a positive one. And it's one where I look yeah. into the future and I just see unbelievable potential and i'm not sure and i think we yeah. as humans are really attracted to the narrative of mystery yes and so because i don't have answers it's a lot more exciting whereas in cli the climate crisis i feel like there's a little bit we kind of know what we're kind of heading towards and it's really yes. not that exciting so i think that was why interesting well so while you were downloading that that last that last principle or concept of there's mystery that mystery, I think, is almost a fruit of, of something that we do in personal development a lot. I do a lot of performance coaching and personal development coaching, and we use the phrase empowerment versus disempowerment. And why you very rarely find a negative Nancy personal development coach is because they live in what I can't do. They live in limitation thinking because limitation thinking is actually good in some ways, but but it's exhausting because the world is telling us what we can't do, where we can't go. Like you're talking about climate change in the oceans. We have investment property on the beach and it was a real conversation for those who are familiar with Florida. Miami is already underwater during rainy season. Like you walk in ankle to calf deep water when like in most of Miami on the beach during rainy season, there's, there's parking. I mean, we just saw the, the condo collapse because of this. And so when we were buying property a little farther north or up the coast, it was a real tangible conversation to see, can we or can we not buy this investment based on how long the time horizon of the ocean rise? And so you're right. It turns into this limitation thinking. But when you talk about tech anything, the person pivots to, well, what can I do? They are not, may, may not be thinking yet about what can I do to save the planet by buying an NFT, but <laughs> we'll get there, right? <laughs> Maybe we'll get there. That's interesting. So, so more in blockchain. So you focus on that. Is it getting the effect you think you wanted? I think for me personally, I'm actually like a lot more excited to have the conversations. It's not that because I think a podcast or any kind of content creation, like me coming on, you know, you are really going to feed off the energy of your guest at the end of the mm -hmm. day. It's just like when, you know, if you've ever performed anything in front of a crowd, if you've given a speech, if you sang, if you've you know, performed as an actor or you, you know, as a musician, whatever it is, the energy that the crowd gives you yes. will totally multiply. And yeah. so I would have guests come on and they were great. There's nothing, there, there's nothing, there were amazing guests, but sometimes we would touch these topics and they would drop stats and it was just kind of like, oh my gosh, like that's <laughs> not, that's made my day worse. And then when I go to edit it and I'm re-listening again and I'm kind of going through and chopping it up, it's just kind of like a PTSD thing. And there really is such thing as like eco depression and people wow. are, you know, it's actually becoming more of a thing. So it, it's totally what you said. It's a flip of mindset. And we talked yeah. about mindset when you came on the podcast when you came on more than blockchain yeah. and you know, it goes from like, I can't do this to how do I do this? Yeah. And I think that that's just such a small, small little thing that a lot of people, you know, they understand the value of that. So it's yeah. not that, you know, I think for me, the climate crisis is something I'm still very much engaged in. And I actually probably read up on it almost as much as I read up on crypto or blockchain because I find it to be so fascinating. But I think it's something that I want to have on my own journey and maybe not necessarily create public content that's up on Spotify <laughs> and, you know, splashed everywhere. You know, if you search yeah. either of us on Google, you get to our content fairly quickly, which is a great thing. Yeah. But I want to make sure that I'm protecting my own energy and yeah. continuing to create stuff that's going to, you know, allow me to be the happiest that I can be as I create content. Cause I think, yeah. as you know, creating content could be a super lonely thing, man. Sometimes yeah. you're like, why am I still doing this? Is anyone listening? What are we doing? You know, and you got to really zoom out to see the, the larger vision. I like that, man. Well, and uh, you know, the, the concept of curating content sounds very two dimensional. It sounds diva like Instagram, like, but I know what you mean when you say it, because from a, from a higher level standpoint, if you Google me and you just skimmed headlines of whether it was my show on YouTube or whether it was my blog post, and you said, okay, what was Grant's message to the world? Grant drops dead. We cremated him. And now we're just reflecting. What was Grant's message? You're right. Like, what was the net impact I had on people's lives? And my thing is, is did I convince people 
even against their will sometimes, that they can make a positive impact in the world. And we, we already are very well acquainted with the negative impact we make. And I think even from a climate perspective, I go, to, I go out to the grocery store and me and my wife have reusable bags. And nearly every time we still get the plastic bags. And like, we know better, we know better. And it's like, we, we accost ourselves, but like, that's what I mean. We, we are so well acquainted with what we can't do. It, it doesn't always seem like a direct line of sight between like, we're going to talk about real estate, holding Bitcoin, and just a quick second, it's not a direct line of sight of how is this? And I think it's the rehearsal of thinking, what can I do? What can I do about Bitcoin? What can I do about climate? What can't, it's that habit, if that makes sense. Yeah, that, that, that totally resonates. I'm, I've just even noticed I've been more excited to do the podcast since I shifted. And I think for me also going from Wi-Fi and water into more than blockchain, I've just felt more focused. And no matter what you're doing, whether it's investing, you're trying to build a business, you're trying to do videos on TikTok about cooking, whatever it is, the more focused you become yeah. about your end goal, yeah. the just, I think the happier you become in the short term, because then yeah. you start to have more of a long-term vision. And one of the things I remember watching, and I'll have to, I can drop this in the show links or I can send this to you. And I may have already sent this to you, but it was this guy talking about a three-year plan. And he was like, you know, if you start a podcast today and you say in six months, I want to be the top of Spotify. It may happen. There's nothing yeah, wrong with that. Sure. But if you say, I want to be the top of Spotify in three years, yeah. well, then every time you put up an episode, maybe you didn't love it. It's okay because it's just one more step in you climbing up this higher mountain. Yeah. And having that mindset is really an important thing. Just like I'm on episode 23 and I'll be putting out 24 soon mm. on this upcoming Tuesday. But it's like, I can't get to 25 until I put out 24. So really only focus on what you can. It sounds like super simple, but yeah, yeah. that has really helped me to align because I know I want to easily get to hundred episodes and then from there continue mm -hmm. to see how I want to grow the, the brand. But it's like, yeah, that's become easier due to the focus, which is kind of what you're saying with the, the energetic alignment. Well, so talking about time horizons for the audience, the reason we carried on this conversation is that Jared and I had several phone calls this week, which were just super fun. But you posed a question with a time horizon that was longer than three years, but not too much longer. And he posed the question, Grant, if you had 100K in your pocket, would you throw this at real estate or would you throw it at Bitcoin? And we bantered a little bit, but I want to hear, I'm posing the question to you now. And for those who don't know, you'll find out super quick, Jared's a Bitcoin maxi. So what is your answer to this? If you had 100K, real estate or Bitcoin and why? So I first want to preface this with, I'm a Bitcoin maxi. And I told you this in the call in theory, but not in practice, because okay. it makes up <laughs> less than three or 4% of my actual crypto holdings. Sure. And, but I do believe that Bitcoin is probably the best asset. And the thing that you do want to start to move mm -hmm. bigger and bigger amounts of your capital, even if yeah. that's going from 1% to 2%. Well, you've doubled your you know, your, your allotment or allocation of investment mm -hmm. into Bitcoin. And so the conversation that we had the other day was fascinating because I standing here right now, I have the hundred K you've just given me hundred K. Thank you yeah. so much, Grant. I would just put it in Bitcoin as opposed to real estate. Mm -hmm. And that is because I think in the next 10 years, if we, or even by 2030, and I was listening to Michael Saylor, who, yeah. if people are new to crypto or Bitcoin, and you don't know who Michael Saylor is, please just go Google Michael Saylor or get into YouTube and you will have an Uber amount of content that you won't be able to like handle. But he said the other day, you know, a million dollars per Bitcoin by 2030 is probably conservative. Mm. So we were saying the other day, if we take the hundred thousand and we put it in the market today, we're going to get about 3.3 .3 Bitcoin because Bitcoin yeah. is around 30,000. So we'll say we get, let's just call it 3.5 just to be round numbers, yep. which would mean that by 2030 in less than eight years, we would have $3.5 million in Bitcoin, which would be real liquidity, which at that point you could sell and then do different things. And I would take that over real estate for a couple of reasons. One, I've never really been in real estate. You have. So I don't really have that knowledge. Mm -hmm. Two, I understand Bitcoin and I understand, you know, how to put it into a, a cold wallet and, and store it in a proper way. And three, I think it's really the thing that the thing that has always been kind of weird for me about real estate was you get the, and I'm excited for you to talk on this because you've dealt with this. You have to deal with humans. Yes. Uh, in, in my life, I've worked jobs. I remember working in high school and I worked in Quiznos for two summers. So I made all the, like the hot subs and, you know, whatever. Yeah. 
And after you work in the food industry, I don't care who you are, even if you're still working in the food industry, you know that the average human, including yourself, because we're all just, you know, we're all just humans walking around. We can be really, really hard to deal with. And if I take that Bitcoin, yeah. I don't have to deal with maintenance. I don't have to deal with tenants. Yeah. I don't have to deal with upkeep. And so for the real estate side, it would just be more of a time suck yeah. than just buying this one time, setting it and forgetting it. Sure. And then continue on with other investments that I have and other things that I'm trying to get off the ground. Mm -hmm. So for me, and we've talked about this too, the importance of time, but this also goes back to goals. And for me, my goal would just be to know that my financial future is totally, you know, totally okay. And yeah. with my belief in Bitcoin, if I were to able to just get those three Bitcoin today, yeah. I wouldn't even have to worry about for me any other long-term investments because I would see that that would be such an appreciating asset mm -hmm. that the world is just slowly more and more going to want to have mm -hmm. that I would be like, okay, great. As opposed to the real estate, I get super worried because there are very few places on the planet now where I both want to live. Sorry, sorry, not let's use cash flowing real estate properties where where I think are going to be around if I get a 30-year lease that I'm guaranteed that A, people are going to want to visit so there's going to be turnover sure. and that B are going to be around at the end of a 30 year lease. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I struggle with. And this comes to like, we have fires in California. Yeah. We have the sea level rise. We have a lot of drought in the middle. If we're just focusing on the United States, I guess you could, but there's just so many things I can't control that I would feel better. Like I have more cards, you know, like I could change my cards up if I could just get that Bitcoin today. But this goes back to what we talked about. This all has to do with your goals yep. and what you see, because the other side of the conversation, and I'll kind of set this up. And then I, I'd love for you to talk about is like, if you wanted to step away from work, maybe yeah. you take that a hundred thousand, you get three rental properties, mm -hmm. you start to get that cash flow, and maybe you get, I'm not sure how much money. Say you get 500 out each month, which I think would be generous. Mm -hmm. You take that 1500, you geo arbitrage, which is how, how I live my life. Yeah. You move down to Colombia, you move down to uh, Central American or South American year, country. Yeah. yeah. And that 1500 feels like 150,000 yeah. in the United States. And now you've created time for which maybe you create another vehicle. So you get a new hundred thousand and then you put that in Bitcoin. So yeah. there is no like easy answer, but I think that's why it's so, you know, when there's not a, when there's not a simple answer, those are the best questions. So with that, what would you do? Would you take the Bitcoin? Obviously, maybe the ideal is you split it between the two. But sure. if you had to choose, <laughs> would you take the Bitcoin or the real estate? And maybe you just want to argue the real estate to just balance out what, what I've been saying. Well, it, well, it does balance out because you, you made the point of people is the problem. And I remember I had um, one of my earliest financial mentors, uh, Scott Parker. He was a real estate developer that I work for. I, I collect the rent checks for him. Like I went around and swept uh, of this like uh, shot out outdoor, indoor, outdoor shopping center in Vero beach. And he used to tell me, how did he word it? He said, I don't care if you get in real estate or not. I don't care if you get in stocks or not. He said, I like to invest in things that I can see the entire way through the deal. I, I, I have clarity from every step of the deal. And, and part of that was I control the elements every step of the way. Um, so we, we mentioned on our call for the benefit of the of listeners, because we're, I'm trying to catch them up while we're also trying to keep this conversation going. Of, I think you mentioned like, what's the value of it? What's your time horizon or something like this? And then I mentioned, well, also, what is your goal? Because it's really important. You might have a hundred K that you could sit on for the next 10 years until 2030, next eight years. And that's solid. But if you're a Bitcoin maxi and you're holding on, it's kind of like these people who have bored apes all the way up to hundred ETH and never sold them because it get, also gives them access to something. So they have the net asset value, but they're petrified of selling. And now it's pulled back to at 1.30 ETH. It's kind of back up a little bit. And, but they're just riding the wave going, I have an asset, but it doesn't mean Jack. Like what, I mean, it gets me access, which is a crypto conversation, but Sitting on a Bitcoin, like what access does it actually give you? It's braggable. So for me, I think about, I think it is cash flow, and I don't mind people. You mentioned the people thing. People are a problem, but you know who the worst people are to me? The people I don't know. Because I, I trust in my ability to work with people. So if I, and we've had, we've had bad renters. And they would call and be like, fix this and fix that. And finally, I had the ability to call them and say, hey, listen, 
you, I like you like me. We're friends like outside of the rental agreement. I said, I like you like me, but we got to have a heart to heart. And that is, is like, these are the terms of your rent. And, and it's that you take care of this. And they felt slighted, but I could at least navigate that conversation. If I don't, I don't care if my, if I buy a place and a place that's going to be around in 30 years, because all the different ways I could pull value out of a property are very well established. Like the fires in California hit, I've got insurance. I'm, I'm, I'm good, son. If, if the waters rise, same story, or I don't actually plan on holding it for 30 years, unless it's like a lifetime family thing. It's very liquid to me. And so in the interim, what do I need right now? And it's cash flow, or you know, there's all the exit strategies. I could do a home equity line of credit. I could flip the property. I could do a refi, and so I could get access to that cash. Now, you mentioned this is starting to happen with Bitcoin. So I guess it's risk. What what's your risk? Like like what's your risk tolerance? Do you have earned income? And I used to say this: risk is inherent in the risk taker, not the investment. So for you, are you mitigating risk or are you trying to leverage when you think about, I would put 100K in Bitcoin hands down. Is it because you don't know another way you could make 3 million in seven years? Is that kind of the thinking or is it because everything else is risky to you? I think the conversation about Bitcoin, and I just want to be, it's cool to be on mic saying this, and I'm not the first one to say this. I'm really just a talking head, but this is something that if you're just hearing crypto or Bitcoin for the first time on Grant's show, yeah. it's really good to say this, but the biggest risk around Bitcoin is not owning any. And I think that that's something I that a lot that of people, ways, yeah. yeah, I just think it's like a really good thing to keep in mind. There's only going to be a finite amount of these things. 19 million are already out in circulation. There's only going to be 21 million. So there's 2 million left. Three to 4 million of them are lost. If you think about Bitcoin as digital real estate. Well, there's only 21 million houses and some of these can be fractionally owned because you can break a Bitcoin down, I think into hundred million pieces, yeah. which are called Satoshis, right? So for me, all the things you've just said, you're totally right. And when we talked the other day, I hadn't thought about the insurance, but for me, long-term, I'm not convinced. I live in a seaside, you know, coastal community here. I'm not convinced in 15 years, the insurance, the insurance people are going to be showing up anymore for these houses. Once you can't insure an asset, it's not worth anything. Yeah. So that to me becomes difficult. And the other thing is you can probably deal with people on a great level, but even that is energy. It's your time. Sure. It's you're at the beach hanging out and then you got to deal with Joe Schmo because Joe Schmo, you know, thinks the washer's broken again. And then there's, you know, whatever, or Joe yeah. shows, you know, dish TV isn't working and that's actually his fault, but you need to walk him through that in a way that's going to make him feel empowered as the renter to be able to figure that out. So for me, when I think about risk, and, and I'm not sure, hmm. the risk for me is lower because I'll free my time up to do other things. And that to me is exciting. It's just to set it and forget it. Yeah. And I also have obviously a really deep conviction, and you've been around Bitcoin for a long time. I have a deep conviction of where this is going, and I've already seen it go crazy places. And I just... We've talked about this the other day, but if, if you're interested in, in this conversation about Bitcoin, Bitcoin maximalism or what Bitcoin could potentially do, I would invite you to read the book, The Bitcoin Standard. Yeah. Because, yeah, you and I talked about this and we kind of shared some tweets on this this morning, but I'm less into the technical analysis of markets and more into like the human dynamics as mm -hmm. you are, mm -hmm. but really from like a historical, when I think about money and money is just a ledger and we as humans always go towards the hardest ledger. And so I think, you know, in 20 or 30 years, the government's going to be able to, you know, you're going to be selling your house in Bitcoin probably the next five to 10 years for sure. I believe that that is complete. And we, you already mentioned one called Miro that's already available. Yeah, it's out of Florida. I think it's Milo or Milo. I can never yeah. remember how to pronounce it, but you can already take your Bitcoin and use your Bitcoin as collateral. So you get to keep your Bitcoin, mm. but obviously in the event that you don't pay your mortgage in fiat in your dollars or your euros or whatever, then they would just take the Bitcoin from you, but you yeah. get to keep the asset as it appreciates. And once again, I'm not exactly sure the interest may be super high because of the volatility of Bitcoin yeah. over the short term when they're trying to figure out how they're going to you know, keep that on the books. But for me, Bitcoin would be the thing, but I'm not sure. Maybe you can, if I'm not answering the question well enough, huh. am I touching upon the risk that you asked about? Because I may not be doing that. I mean, no, <laughs> I mean, you kind of answer that because my question, my question wasn't like, tell me about your, your, tell me about why this is about risk for you. It actually sounds like it's far more rational. And I'm going to do something real quick. I'm going to share my screen. I don't often do this during shows, but I, I think I need people to see the supply and demand curve of Bitcoin because I think- Please do, is, yeah. 
this is where you're you're coming from. So for pe- for those who don't know, this orange chart is the halvings. And oftentimes it, it's visualized as kind of a curve that's tapering off. And for those who don't know, big economics and pricing in general is a very hard science. And in traditional markets like the US dollar, it's very hard to gauge because supply and demand are constantly jockeying. And then that where they cross is kind of where price happens, or at least it's where people make a buying decision like right here, this is demand curve, or this is the supply curve. And it's right here. It's a very limited supply. 21 million is all that will ever happen. But as the demand goes up, and this is the daily demand estimate, this is what the demand has been, and they're going to intersect right here. You're calling 2030. Michael Saylor's calling for before or around then, but these guys are calling for before then. But when this curve actually in reality intersects this curve, there's going to be a huge inflection because demand is going to be like, oh, well, we'll use it for this. But supply is just constantly limited, which is one of our first asset classes that has ever been like mathematically limited. And no one can come in and jerk around the supply, which means it's far more predictable than any asset class that it's going up in value. So I say that to, to respond to your question about risk. It sounds like it's a little bit of a risk thing, but it sounds like it's far more of a rational thing that Like you haven't done real estate, so you're not sure of how certain real estate is and supply and demand are always going. And the Fed is messing with interest rates and that messes with people's psychology. But who's who's messing with the supply of Bitcoin? And yeah, that to me is paramount. And I'm really glad that you shared that because when you look at that, we're going to have a halving and the Bitcoin halving is basically where literally the amount of supply that is dropped out for every block on the blockchain that is validated essentially gets cut in half. Yeah. And I think we're at 3.25 now. So it's going to go to 1.7 for 3.5 is going to 1.75, whatever. It doesn't matter. You know, if we're at 10 now, it will be cut down to five. It's going to be cut in half. Yeah. And so I said this on one of my podcasts because I was trying to kind of explain it like I'm five because sometimes that's the easiest way for me to understand this. Sure. But it's like, if you have 10 people in a room and then you have... 10 glasses of water. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're good. You cut five glasses of water out of that equation. The price may have gone up double, but if it's something really valuable like water, the price could go wherever it wants. And then when you cut that down to two and a half glasses and you still have 10 people, but you actually have 12 people now because we waited a couple of years and and the people in the room have grown. (laughs) Babies are being born. So as the supply is decreased and the demand increases exponentially, what does that leave you? Well, it leaves you with a price that no one really knows where it's going to go. It's something we, we can really wrap our heads around. One of the ways Bitcoin is created using proof of work, which essentially means like you have to have miners. Yeah. But I had never thought about this, and this was shared with me recently, and it may have been actually on one of my most recent podcasts, which I believe was episode 22, where I had a Bitcoin maximalist on, and he was just amazing. It's an amazing episode. Mm. But if you think about the housing, this is an actual way to create apples and apples with Bitcoin, so it's not apples and oranges with housing and real estate. Okay. If you think about that, the reason why a house is so valuable is because there are there's a, there's a limited amount, yeah. and we're going to continue to create them. But in order to create a house, we have to put in a lot of work, which is kind of like the proof of work of the miners. And that is really what backs the value of a home. Well, okay, the wood has gone up because of supply chain issues, because of inflation, because gas has gone up, because of the pandemic, because China stopped exporting so much, because Canada didn't want to give us whatever it was. So then the amount that goes into the home has increased, therefore the value has increased because now the general contractors are going to sell it to the developers at a different price. The developers are going to put it on the market. They have to get their 30%, so on and so forth. So the price continues to go up. Yeah. So if you think about Bitcoin as 21 million homes, I think it becomes a much easier conversation. There's just 21 million homes in cyberspace versus how many homes you have here. Now I'm in Massachusetts, which is a pretty nice real estate market like many other places. Mm -hmm. But if you think about my home, let's say my home was worth $500,000. The amount of people in the world that could buy my home, who could afford my home is a lot. Who can buy my home and want to live in this town? We're going to get down to a couple hundred. And then who show up to bid is a certain amount. But what if everyone in the world could buy my home? Yeah. That's what Bitcoin is. And I think the, the antagonists, the, the opponents of Bitcoin, they have a question that I, of Bitcoin, 
I can answer this question for a lot of other Web3 or crypto projects in a different way. But for Bitcoin, the argument of that's a great apples to apples comparison. But what the Oracle of Omaha would say, Warren Buffett, no one needs a Bitcoin. They need a house. But I think you've spent more time with Bitcoin. What is the rising? What is, is the demand? Is the demand all speculative or is it becoming functional at all? So Bitcoin outside of like other cryptos, and I'm going to speak about this and I'm sure, please, I want someone to tweet at me and say, you were wrong. This is why this is what you can use Bitcoin sure. for. Cause then I'll learn as well. Bitcoin as it is right now, I don't really know what you can use it for. Obviously on some platforms you can leverage it and then get fiat back in a yeah. loan. Yeah. So it is seen as collateral, but to, to talk about Warren Buffett's point, I think he's totally right. I can't sleep in a Bitcoin. It doesn't give me shelter. If we think about sure. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, yeah. it doesn't fulfill, it doesn't put food in my belly if I'm not going to sell it. Like, so what does it really do? And I think what it does is it allows me, and this is something that I only learned recently from a guest on the podcast, which is really great. It's not really an investment. Bitcoin is the first time in my life, because I've grown up in the fiat standard, where I can take my economic energy, yeah. put it into Bitcoin. Okay. And it's a savings. It's a savings instrument. So that way when my children, oh yeah, it's a store of value, but in a different way that we've ever seen, because gold can inflate, like the price, you know, the, the, the supply of gold can go up. So for me, it's like, this is the other thing you have to, I mean, I have a job, which, which is giving me income. I have a couple side hustles, which give me income, which allow me to take the hundred thousand dollars in the hypothetical and put it in Bitcoin. Sure. Now, if I were broke on the street and that money came to me, obviously Maslow hierarchy of need kick in. I need shelter, I need security, I need safety, I need some food in my belly. So I think when we talk about investments yeah. or Bitcoin, it's a pretty privileged conversation. But to answer <laughs> Warren sure. Buffett, it is 100%. I mean, we have we have money that we can do something with other than just survive, which on planet Earth right now is really difficult. Mm -hmm. But I think to answer Warren Buffett, it's like, dude, you hold Coca-Cola stock for 75 years. Does yeah. that keep you like Tell me how that works. Now, I know that he may get dividends off it, which then he turns into fiat and then he's able to afford his things. Sure. But I do think in the future with the lending in 10 years of a Bitcoin is worth a million dollars. Banks are going to be like, yeah, give me your Bitcoin. I need yeah. that. You know, there's going to be different thing, layer two solutions yeah. that are going to build off of it that banks are going to want to hold this to show stuff. liquidity. Exactly. To then be able to rent out fiat to people. So yeah. for me, it's also like, Bitcoin is so new and so nascent that, you know, if I said, man, why spend so much time on the internet in 98, you may not have an answer, sure. you know, but it's, it's like, we new, don't yet yeah. know the value and the utility of Bitcoin yeah. because I do believe it's going to be absolutely crazy. And by the time an average people are not going to be able to afford it. Well, and so that point is very important I, because when you asked the question, I was really challenged with it. And I wondered why I was challenged with it because I have my teeth in real estate. Now, for those, if you haven't picked this up, I'm also eyeball deep in crypto at this point. And, eyeball deep. <laughs> and, and so it was a difficult conversation. And I was challenged with this. What brings this value? And you might've heard this, the three aspects of money, it's a storehouse of value, medium of exchange, and a standard of measure. And this is why puka shells or salt could be this. It's what we have full faith in. And for whatever, whatever reason has society has brought this about, salt, the giant wheels on Easter Island, like whatever the reason was that money happened, it became a standard of measure, storehouse of value, and medium of exchange. This is what has been so interesting about Bitcoin. And what you said, in so many years, once everyone does want it, it won't be affordable. The point of that that is so important is this is why I think it is important that people jump in now. We talked about empowerment early on in this episode, and I was thinking about the recipients of your work in Columbia. I was thinking, in terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if you're on the street in Boston, that's one thing. But if you're on the street in Columbia or Haiti, that's another thing. And if I could give you a liquidity that circumvents a corrupt government, you would rather have that. I remember, you'd appreciate this. We used to do these shoe drops, like Tom's shoes in Haiti. I had the advantage of being on the ground for weeks on end in Haiti. And so you'd have these short-term missionaries who would come. They'd do these clothing drops and shoe drops. And then they would leave, and then a new group would come in. And I got to watch. I remember I was so disenchanted. I got to watch them do a shoe drop. And the locals received that. The Haitians put the shoes on. The kids ran around with these shoes, and they were so grateful. 
and they would turn around and sell them on the market as soon as the missionaries left. I want the fiat. I'm like, I don't need shoes. There, like, there comes a point. You're talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but for those in the developing world, that hierarchy is actually different. And sometimes liquidity in a cryptocurrency can make more sense than actually giving them a house. The Tom's thing is a super interesting business model. You know, you and I go to a mall in the United Good States, and bad, right? And we buy some Toms and Grant and Jared are just so happy because now we've changed the world. And so then two pairs of Toms get sent to another part of the world that maybe we've never been to, whatever. And I remember being in Guatemala and this is years ago when I was in the Peace Corps and some volunteers were talking about how they had seen Toms kind of come to their town. Yeah. And it was this huge truck just full of Toms. Mm -hmm. And once the people kind of caught on to the idea that, hey, these are shoes for poor people because no yes. one wants to be seen as poor. Yes. They all of a sudden didn't want them. The utility behind the shoe was lost to the social utility, which yes. branded them as poor. So I thought that that was a very interesting thing. And I, and I think it goes back to the conversations we were having exactly about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And it's just kind of like at the end of the day, and this is one of my buddies, Dan, who I did grad school with and I did grad work with, and he's been doing payments and payment processing and basically how to get people tied into bankless people tied yeah. into the the more quote formal banking economy yeah. and he's always just said we just not need to give people money and let them do what they want to do and yes like there's universal con basic income experiments yeah and in the developing world there's these things called ccts i believe and uh conditional cash transfers which is like grant you want money where the government I'm the Guatemalan government, you have a family, you have these two sons. And so I'd like to give you money, but let's do it conditionally. I need you to have a little buy-in. So what I'm going to ask is that you take your sons and your family for, you know, doctor's appointments and you guys do certain things that will be good for citizenry, like as citizens. Yeah. And because of that, we'll give you, if you check off these things, then we'll give you, you know, what would be, I don't know, a couple hundred bucks a month, but a couple sure. hundred bucks a month will change your life. Right. It will allow you to get your rice and beans and kind of be on your merry way, maybe pay for your rent, whatever it is. And so I've always found that just giving people the power to decide what they want to do with their money is the yeah. best because yeah. you take a hundred people in any country, even the United States, you pick a hundred people mm -hmm. and you say, would you rather have cash or this other thing? It could even sure. be anything that has to do with Maslow's hierarchy needs. I'll give you a hundred dollars in cash or I'll take a hundred dollars off your rent. I'll give you a hundred dollars for a food stipend. I'll give you a hundred dollars for some healthcare, whatever it is. Mm. People are just gonna say, no, give me the cash because a hundred people aren't going to decide on one thing that they all collectively need. They're just gonna say, give me the cash. We're all going to make our own decisions. How closely have you looked at the Grameen bank? Oh, see, here we go. And this is why I love connecting with you because every time we connect, we learn. I have not looked at that. Okay. Are you familiar with the name even? No. So go so ahead, Muhammad please. Yunus, you would absolutely, especially with your work in Colombia, I didn't even know you were part of the Peace Corps. So that's awesome. If you look at this, he started micro lending 40 years ago Okay. in India. And I believe he was an economics professor and he was teaching free market economics in Delhi or something like this. And he walked outside literally stepping over poor people. And he was teaching a system, and you know this from narco state work in Colombia and, and non narco state work, just development, bankless. I, that term is actually spot on now. He, he realized I'm teaching free market economics, but the currency of our modern developing capitalist society is not like what we picture like resources. It's actually the opposite, it's being indebted. It's called a credit system. <laughs> and, and, and that's the, the actual core currency of the modern developed world is credit and, and my ability to get credit. And this is why my real estate mentor would always say he wants to get in real estate because he's in more debt. The more debt you're in, if it's smart debt, you're actually wealthier you are because that's the weird and it's philosophically screwed up, but it's accurate. <laughs> So <laughs> yeah, I want to, I want to quasi cut you off and I'm going to dive into that deeper. And that's really yeah. great because micro lending is something that is all around the developing world and the micro lending and yeah. this idea of having just abundant cash to give to people who need help comes to this, the fiat standard. And yes. I've spoken to you earlier about the Bitcoin standard, and I actually don't know where that book is. It's somewhere that's in my okay. room, I'll but the it. fiat standard is a book I just got. And it was actually given to me by a Bitcoin maximalist who came on more than blockchain. Yeah. But the fiat standard talks about that. It talks about this crazy world that we live in. And you can tell it's not a sound money world because if it yeah. were a sound money world, you wouldn't need to get in debt. You would that's just right. need to save up your whatever it is. <laughs> 
your coins. But because we don't live in a sound money world, those who are indebted the most are the ones that have the most power. If we think about Donald Trump, he's probably the most classic example. You're like, oh, he's so bad. He's in all this debt. I'm like, well, it depends what kind of debt it is. It depends how he's leveraging it. It depends who gave him that debt. Yeah. And I remember Grant Cardone talking about this. He said in 2008, he was in real estate, big real estate guy. And he said, you know, he had $50 million in debt. He thought it was a big shot, big shot, $50 million in debt. And 2008 comes along, the banks come knocking. They say, hey, you got to pay up. He goes belly up yeah, because 50 million. He said, I will never make that mistake again. Mm. And I remember he was on a podcast talking about this. And the guy's like, okay, well, what are you going to do for the next time? He said, well, next time. And now he's talking in hindsight about the pandemic. So, well, the next time I'm going to have so much money that the banks don't call me and say, give me money. They call me and say, let's have a talk because they, I'm too big to fail. So the pandemic came around. He had $2 billion in debt, which is 40 times more debt than he had. If my math is right. Yes. 40 times more debt than he had. Mm -hmm. And the banks did that. They said, well, now we have to have a conversation. So you almost want to be too big to fail in That's the debt game. Right. <laughs> and that is how, you know, and people are like, what do you mean? We're not on sound money. Like what is sound money or hard money? Well, hard money is we're not there. Because if we were there, then you wouldn't be taking out debt. You would be accumulating whatever the money is. You and, know? And, and who gets lost in a credit system? And so this, this, is the, this is why we have a term called the bankless. To your point, like the Grant Cardone conversation, everyone thinks if you, pay, if you dole out that anecdote, they think what you're going to say is during the pandemic, he was sitting on $2 billion in cash. No, he said, I'm going effing deeper. And, that, and now I'm so deep, I can't get screwed. I'm just going to go all out to the hill. And then you're like, well, that had also is a very privileged conversation because when Muhammad Yunus 40 years ago steps across these poor people, he realizes I'm teaching free market economics and 99% of the world still will never be able to perform in that ecosystem because in credit, credit is given in an asset-based mm -hmm. society. And these are people without social security numbers. These are people who are born without papers. These are people who are born in his world in a lower caste that aren't even considered – you know, touchable as, as we know anecdotally about what the untouchables are. And so his thing is, is how do we do micro lending? What are assets that the assetless have? What is leverage that we can have a higher, we can basically banks are asking ourselves, what's our risk profile? They look at your assets. That's how we have it in this credit system. But right. when someone has no credit, what do they have? How do we mitigate risk to give them money? And what they found was through a series of experiments, they found that if we do cohorts of five people, we give them a, a capped micro loan. They submit an idea. Instead of warm sodas on the corner, I'm going to do cold soda. So I need 25 US dollars, not a lot of money, but for them, it's a lot to buy a, a cooler and ice in the morning. And now instead of charging 10 cents, I can now charge 20, double my revenue. The cohort of five all have to come from the same neighborhood, the same block. And they have to meet weekly mm -hmm. to pay in mm -hmm. weekly interest. And only if everyone pays back their loan over whatever the time period is, they can then nearly triple or quadruple the, the resources they get access to next. And so what they found is the asset that the bankless have is social connections. Mm. And we know that your place in a community and the relationship you have is survival. It's survival. And so this model now is, has just spread out with Kiva and all sorts of things. There's mm -hmm. so many microloans now, but this circles me back to a question for you. We're talking about morally and ethically, we could look at our credit system and see how atrocious, but there's the Grant Cardones of the world that say, it might be ethically or morally stupid. But I'm going to play the game. But now with Bitcoin, you have the opportunity to play a different game. I don't even know if it's a better game, but maybe morally and ethically, it's more sound. So when we circle back to the original question. The 100K. If you had 100K and you could put it <clears throat> into real estate or Bitcoin, you said to a T, Bitcoin. But given the conversation we've had, would you say it is still a rational conversation? Is it an ethical conversation? Are you any more clear on why? Am I, am I, I think one of the things that when I think about that decision, I have 100K on my desk, it just comes down to time. 
It comes right. down to time and knowledge. Like I've never done the real estate deal before and you have. Mm. So I don't have the knowledge of that. Whereas, like I said, I can understand the entire process of getting Bitcoin, putting it on a cold storage wallet and then sitting on it. And then for me, it's the time, like we've talked about mm. of not dealing with humans and the maintenance and all the upkeep. And, you know, mm. if the roof gets damaged and I have to, you know, deal with the insurance agency and all that, it's just yeah. kind of like a set and forget it. I don't know if anything has changed. I, I think... What has changed is I need to, and I've always known this and I, you know, I have my, I have real estate books here. I need to dive deeper into yeah. understanding the other option because like, you know, when you make a decision, you don't want to think about the other option. But if I buy a hundred K Bitcoin yeah. at 30,000, then it goes down to 20,000. Well, first of all, I'm going to be like, damn it. Like I could have gotten a lot more Bitcoin, but then I'm also going to start to think, oh, you know, we all think this no matter what we do with our, with our investments or, or any, any decision we make in life. You know, if you get the chocolate ice cream, you're going to be thinking about the pistachio that you didn't say no to. So <laughs> I think I need to, uh, the, I don't, I don't know. I didn't yeah, want to say so random, yeah. it's so random, but I, I feel like it's, I feel like I need to understand the other side better and yeah. see what that looks like. Because for me, it's a real hands-off approach. And I think this is the other thing hmm. that we don't often talk about when we think about investing. I had a G-Clef on my podcast and he was saying, you don't even call Bitcoin an investment. It's more like an acquisition is what we're saying because it's a savings. It's not an investment. An investment implies you have to stare at the market all day. You have to do technical analysis. You have to sit on a TA chart. You have to talk to people. You have to read the Wall Street Journal. You have to have your mastermind group. Bitcoin changes all that. You know, like all I see, if you watch TV in the United States, you see a couple things. One of the things you constantly see is someone telling you how to manage your wealth. This wealth management company, da, 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 all those people are wiped out with Bitcoin. They're gone. I don't need some dude, some lady, some person in a nice shiny suit that drives a car that I think is great to tell me what to do with my money or when to move it or how to allocate it, or we're going down to a bear market. So I got to put it in gold and silver. None of that. So I think Bitcoin changes the idea of how we think with money. Cause I think for you and I, it's like when we invest our money, this yeah. is something we need to stay on top of. And you came on my podcast. And mm -hmm. for those people interested to hear that conversation, we talked about decentralized finance, mm -hmm. but one of the things we talked about is how you're not a trader and you're not an investor, but you're a momentum investor. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? It means we, I, you know, it means you keep your ear to the grindstone and you come into markets when it makes sense. You yeah. sell real estate when it makes sense. You move your portfolio from real estate, maybe into crypto when mm -hmm. it makes sense and crypto into real estate when it makes sense. And so that idea, I think is something that you and I kind of like about our investments that we have to stay on top of them. Mm -hmm. We have to watch them. You know, I'm in Ethereum. I'm like, oh my God, what's Vitalik doing? He's saying all these controversial <laughs> things. His, his tweets are crazy right now. It's like, his wait, tweets are crazy. I wake up this morning, you know, Ethereum is supposed to go to 2.0, which essentially, if, if you have no idea what that means, essentially Ethereum is going to go from proof of work to proof of stake, which will dr dramatically change the way that Ethereum runs. So I'm like so involved. And honestly, these are just narratives. Whereas Bitcoin changes all that. And I don't think you and I are ready for that. Like if we could take all of our money right now, all of our liquidity and just buy Bitcoin because we're so active and maybe we want to be a part of our investments. I think that's like a hard thing maybe for you and I and many people to wrap their minds around mm -hmm. that Bitcoin is really just to set it and forget it. Because up until you have something like Bitcoin, you're really just, you have cash, you have stocks, bonds, real estate, you know, yeah. I'm not really sure where else you're going to put your money in big, in big portfolio folders. That's kind of where it all goes into. Maybe you're investing mm -hmm. in a business or in a startup, you know what I mean? But Bitcoin changes that, but all those things are kind of active. And so I see Bitcoin more as a passive investment because once I would buy it today and it's at 30,000, so we'll say 3.3, but I'll round up to 3.5 Bitcoin. Once I have that, I don't have to do anything. And so that to me, until somebody tells me, shows me something better where it's a set it and forget it, then I am, I, I think that's it. I think it's a time thing. And I think- Is that the our, same as gold? It, it is, but the thing with gold, you know what? It is. It kind of is. I mean, you have to it, store it, I guess, but- You have general. to store it. Yeah. But if we, if we, if we assume that we're going to store both of them, it kind of is. But I obviously believe that the- case for Bitcoin's appreciation over the next 10 to 15 years is going to be that much greater than gold. Yeah, because supply still fluctuates on gold and supply will not fluctuate. I mean, aside from people cornering the market and hoarding, but it doesn't even need liquidity yet. We're still so early. It's being introduced to the market. It's like gold 
when gold is being first introduced to the market. Like there's not much new gold being added by research and digging. So it's almost like gold is like Bitcoin 50 years after we hit 21 million, right? So there's still opportunity. So that speaks to something that I want to understand about you and that maybe our listeners or viewers could understand. What is your investment goal? What is your wealth goal? This is a this is a really good question. And I'm I was thinking about this a couple of days ago because I need to really hone in on this because I used to think it was financial independence, you know, allowing me to basically do what I want to do, which is essentially mm. get enough investments in and then you live off them. Like that is really mm. just financial independence or fire, you know, retire early, basically <laughs> being able to choose what you want to do, whatever you want to say, but it's, you have enough economic energy that you can live off the little parts that it creates monthly. So that way I can podcast or I can go surfing or I can take care of my children, or I can make sure I'm going to be at Susie's dance recital. Cause last, you know, last quarter I couldn't do it. Cause I had to go to the partner's meeting, whatever it is for me, it was the creation of time, but as I get deeper into crypto, one of the things I'm really looking at is when, so I'm going to try to answer your question, but what I want to talk about how I think I get there. And maybe that will, the how will explain the, 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 what the, how is that when Ethereum goes from proof of work to proof of stake, you're no longer going to need miners to validate and to secure the network. You're going to use people having staked their economic energy via Ethereum on in nodes, and then those will secure the network. And so I think, and I could be super wrong about this, but you'll need 32 Ethereum to be able to basically run your own game, play your own validator, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so if you have 32 Ethereum and you're able to do that annually, I think you'll get out, I don't know, one or two Ethereum. So that's, that's cool. Math. And if you get two Ethereum right now, that would be about... $4,000 annually. Yep, exactly. But if Kathy Wood is right, and a lot of people hate on Kathy Wood, and I think it's funny because the people who get the most hate in the world are the people who do the most brilliant things. Yeah. So Kathy Wood gets a lot of hate, but she said that, you know, by 2028, 2030, Ethereum could go to $80,000 per Ethereum. If it really does live up to the Amazon web service of the decentralized world, yeah. if it backs everything. So if it goes to $80,000, even if you think inflation is going to continue at 7 to 10%, whatever it is, if you get two of these things annually, that's $160,000 and you've done nothing but leave your Ethereum there and let it kind of funnel. Mm -hmm. So that new idea of like, that to me is the new financial, financial mm -hmm. independence or fire model, mm -hmm. which isn't using banks or using stocks or using real estates. It's using crypto. And this is kind of staking and DeFi in many ways. Yeah. To have enough that you put it up there and then you get it back. Now, there's so many things that can go wrong with what I've just said, sure. but all that is to say, I still feel like my wealth goal is to be able to get to that point. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you the date I've set for it is summer of 2026. And that is because the World Cup is coming to the US, Canada, and Mexico. And every single time the World Cup is on, I have to watch every game. It's like my thing. Yeah, That's yeah. it. You know, some people are into the Olympics. I'm into the World Cup. I'm a huge soccer fan. So I've given myself to 2026, really till 2025, because I need to have my investments going yeah. a year before so I can start to do the short-term capital gains, you know, have them all in by 2025. So by the summer of 2026, I can start to draw on that, whatever that looks like, whether it's Ethereum, whether it's real estate, whether it's crypto, whether it's something else, I would not be selling my Bitcoin in this, just so I can say that. In this scenario, yeah. <laughs> in this scenario. But so for me, it's like, figuring out by 2026, the summer, how I can have time freedom to do whatever I want to do. And probably that's going to look like me continuing to podcast, create more content, and ideally have enough where I can travel around the world and meet up with people from every country, which would be kind of crazy, sit down with some mics and say, Hey, let's talk about crypto. Let's talk about Dude. blockchain. Let's see what this is doing on the ground. Because I think for many people, and this is something we've talked about today, people are like, cool, man, you got a Bitcoin. What, what does that do? What does that do? Can you buy food with it? No, I can't buy food. Can you pay the rent? No, I can't pay the rent. Can you pay your car payment? No, I can't. So then if you can't do those things, then what value does it have? But these conversations are already evolving and around the world, it's already changing. One of the things I want to do is go in December to El Salvador to really go see what's going on there. Cause I still don't, yeah, I still don't think that I was seeing something the other day, that like only 20% of businesses are like accepting it. And a large majority of people just aren't using it. Hmm. And that's interesting to me. And I just want to go kind of check in on that because I know that, yeah. you know, naive 
Bukele, the president, is obviously like literally a god for this stuff because he's taken this country and said, this is going to be our legal tender. Yeah. But I really want to go, go yeah. out to the far lands there and go out to a farmer and say, hey, are you using Bitcoin? Do you mind if I interview? Can we sit down and talk yeah. about this? And, you know, do it out in Spanish. I'll have it in Spanish and then I can translate in real time on the podcast in English. Like I have to figure out how that's going to work or maybe there'll be video. But I really think crypto, blockchain, all this stuff is going to continue to show up for ideally the bankless. Because if it doesn't help, if it doesn't help the less of us, like the lesser people of the economic food chain, whatever that looks like, whatever, however you just de define poor or impoverished or marginalized, what's the point? Yeah. Then we're just recreating the legacy system, which we know is super unequal. I think we share this. I, you know, we were on the missionary field and we, we've removed our religion out of it, but the thing that we loved and still to this day are grateful for those experiences are being exposed to radical service, you know, just, just getting involved. I, I have never felt more fulfilled, more energized, more adventurous than when I have been in those places, asking those questions, mm. validating those answers. And even the gratitude of having these conversations, in my case with local Haitians, the gratitude they would express that someone was willing to hear because they knew that I would have a million of these conversations and, and, and expose the reality. To me, when we were in the Dominican Republic, and it was a very difficult time for me. I mean, we were self-funded. Geo Arbitrage was working in our favor. We could have kept going for like another two years. Mm -hmm. But I was watching our accounts go down, and I had a very difficult time just mentally. I was, I was given freedom. There's a great book out there. It's a religious book, but the title is just rich. It was called The Burden of Freedom by Dr. Miles Monroe. And I think most people say they want financial freedom, but they don't because they don't envision the responsibility is a highly aware, highly responsible, highly proactive individual. Passive income is only for the second generation. The third generation loses the wealth. The second generation spends it. It's the only generation that actually experiences passive income. Like even in this scenario, you're painting where you grow by 2025 and even liquidating responsibly. You mentioned a few trigger words. I'm working capital gains right. And like that is a massive risk. People, I mean, that's why people don't do it. It's a massive responsibility to think, oh shit, what's the date that is 12 or 13 months so that I can pull out my, you know, you have to keep track of so much. It's, it's actually a lot of responsibility. I say all that to say when we were in the DR and we were coming back our core value that we had was sustainability, self-sustainability. We experienced that we were very expensive, poor people. We this is us, you and your wife. Me and my wife. Gotcha. We, were on, we were on the missionary field, self-funded, and we were watching other missionaries going back to the States on sabbatical and fundraising. And like of their fundraising budget, they'd raise 120K and like 80 of what? it was their salary. And you're like, how much of this goes to people that you're serving? And the response to a person was like, well, we got to prep for retirement. And you're like, wait a minute. We've thrown in with the least of these, and this is my fate, but we're giving ourselves a golden parachute, but selling, we call it selling poverty, poverty porn. Oh, for sure. And, and for sure. I, our stomachs churned at this. We're like, oh my God. And so we said, we're going to come back to the States. We've got to, with integrity, build up our own streams of income so that we can do what you're saying is now without a financial agenda, can I show up and tell these stories? It's the most important. It's the only way to do it authentically. I think. Because otherwise, you're, there's, there's performance happening on some level. You're performing well, to the people that are staking you with this money. You're performing to the people that are there because you built in a $40,000 agenda, which you do not need in the Caribbean. No. You could live on 10,000. You could live on less than $1,000 a month and live well. Yeah. So- yeah. Maybe not in all the places. I mean, I'm, sure. I'm maybe not in all the countries, but from my experience and, and, you know, everyone has a different lifestyle and how they'll live. The thing that that brought up for me was this idea. And this is an idea that I floated to someone in Colombia. And this is what I kind of want to do. And I don't really know how to do it, but I would love if someone just staked me. So I didn't have to worry about the money, <laughs> you know, just making like the basic, I'm not trying to make money out of this. I'm yeah. just trying to do this. I just want to, I think that that's, that's web three for me. I just yeah. want to do things. Web yes. two is like, you know, figuring out how you get the most out of it. Web three yeah. is figuring out how you give the most. And so that's good. One of the things I really want to do is go down to Colombia mm -hmm. and 
there's two components to this. Like, I think when we talk about crypto, we talk about Bitcoin. For us, we are forgetting a massive thing that we're both highly aware of, but we just, we don't even talk about it, which is financial literacy. And yes. just even having the discussion of stop buying your Yeezy, you know, whatever you're spending. Like I was in, I was, I was shopping yesterday and I'll go back to the idea I have in Colombia. I was getting some food yesterday, which was unbelievably expensive. And I'm like, yeah, inflation exists. This is real. Like, okay. <laughs> And I'm in line and there, and there's this, and there's a mother in front of me. She's got two kids and the kids are being kids. They're running around, they're touching things. She's trying to like corral them, but she's got on Yeezy, these Yeezy slippers. You know, I, you've probably seen them, the foam slippers, they're like $300. Yeah. Now, whether they're real and she yeah. paid $300 or whether they're knockoffs and she paid $50, either yeah. way, she's trying to appear in a way that like, to me, is just so interesting because all the people in the world that kind of have money that I know that have real wealth and they aren't working anymore. And they've, you know, they've taught to, they taught me about tenants of fire. You wouldn't know yeah. they're wearing ratty clothes. Yes. They're rolling out. They got a Honda civic they bought from 2010 used. Yeah. And then it's like the other side is this performative. I have to look good for the gram. I have to look good even when mm -hmm. I'm going to shop to pick up a couple avocados. <laughs> Anyways, all these things here to say that I do think that there's a lot of conversations that need to happen before people kind of get into crypto or understand blockchain or understand any of that. Yeah. So I would like to go to Colombia and I need to first have the literacy conversation, but then yeah. followed by that, once you have those tenants down, I want to talk about Bitcoin very, very shortly after that. Yeah. And one of the things I'd love to do is create a course and go around and just spend a week in a town yes. and choose town specifically because they're tiny and I can get... 30 to 50 people in a room in this town and do it, you know, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for two hours, I'm going to go and give a little speech mm -hmm. and you're going to come. And at the end, you're going to get an NFT that says, you know, you've taken my thing and you can show that to the world, Yeah, whatever. If anything in Latin America, if you show up and you give promise people a diploma at the end and there's coffee and bread, yes. they'll show up every they'll single day. Yeah. <laughs> they, they may not listen, but yeah. they'll be there. And it's that's true fine. In Haiti too. Yeah, it's 90%, you know, 90% of uh, life is just showing up. So anyways, that's something I would really, really like to develop and do. Yeah. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't need more than honestly, like $25,000 for someone to just hear this and be like, oh yeah, I'll send them down there. And I would go do it. And it would be an amazing year. And along the way, I would be teaching at night. And then during the day, I would be going around and trying to record for more than blockchain, yeah. as many conversations as I could have both locally. And then with connecting with people around the world, using yeah. Zoom and using other platforms like Discord to have conversations. So that is something I would really love to do. And to be frank, like, I don't know if anyone from my, the company I work for, my web two company is going to hear this, but like, I would put in my two week tomorrow. If yeah. someone's like, yeah, here's this, like create me a budget and go do that because that to me is so important. And so many people, yeah. especially in Colombia, the peso is dying. It was down 17 to 18% last year. Wow. So that's a 17 to 18% tax if you're just making the peso. And that's mm. brutal. And most people don't really understand that. And that's just the currency devaluation. That's not even discussing the fact that tomates are now more, aguacates are now more. Mm. Um, you want to get your car washed, that's now more. You want to travel, that's now more. Yeah. I, I would ask for nothing in return yeah. of that entire thing. Just go out and do it. You know, you raised several killer points. Number one, I did want to call out this because you said it offhand. And for those who are listening, who are learning this financial vocabulary. When you say financial literacy, I think we're both thinking of Robert Kiyosaki, who really made that big inside of me a little bit. He, uh, he often used the term literacy, yes, but all you need to do for financial literacy is have financial vocabulary. And we're talking about Web3. And when people are hearing Web3, they're hearing the tech stack and they're hearing coding. And you and I know, no, that's blockchain and that's crypto. When we talk about Web3, we're talking about a whole a cultural philosophy that's shifting. And you said, web two is about how much can I get out of it? Let's maximize what I can get out of the system. And web three is let's maximize what I can give. So I, what I'm taking is just enough. What I'm giving is everything because we're finally seeing the possibility that we can go be rewarded for being ourselves. The hyper micro niche of caring about awesome stories and the ethos of web three is Let's help one another. You and I, before this call, just were reflecting on a previous conversation that was like, hey, how are we going to protect ourselves? And you and, my, you and my responses to a person aren't, well, no, how can we just give more faster? <laughs> you know, less exactly. barriers, more speed. Let's go. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so I appreciate that about you. But, the, but then all of that to hone in and, and just agree, this point of financial literacy is huge. An example I thought of is you mentioned investing being looking at charts. 
the reason I love the word investing is, is I literally picture the opposite. I don't have to look at charts. That's trading. Trading okay. cool. is looking cool. at charts. Investing is I have a holistic understanding of a thing and I invest, I inject money into it. And now my only job is managing it. Another piece of vocab is I don't believe that there is such a thing as passive income. I, I was going to, I wanted to hit you on that because you were saying right. passive income and I wanted to hit you that I don't believe that that's true. I think that that's something yeah. that we're sold. Yes. And yeah, I do believe like the, the people that I know that have passive income set up, yeah. they still work 10 to 15 hours a yes. week on phone calls, talking to the people they have their deals set up. Advisors, with. lunches, golfs. Uh, yeah, whatever. they're still, but those things, when you're at those conversation levels, that's kind of fun. It doesn't it seem fun. like work because you're just talking about, as you say, how do you actively manage the passive income? And that's yeah. what people don't understand. There is an active, there's an active role in yeah. any, in any passive action. I do believe there's passive growth and that's what you're talking about. Sure. Time. Sure. And when you talk about Bitcoin, if we were not talking about crypto and you came to me and said, Grant, there's a new metal we found in the earth and we, we have measured it and we know that there's only about 21 metric tons and we know for a fact that Apple is using it for its next phone and then who away and then everyone's going to be swarming this. So the demand is going up, but we know absolutely guaranteed there's only 21 metric tons. This is the next titanium. To be good stewards of this industry, I think we need to be cultivating our conversation so that when we're talking about wealth building, as a, as a savings class and at a resource class, sure. Bitcoin is a new resource class that mathematically forcibly limited supply mathematically provable exponential growth in demand. You are on the growth curve of a new resource class that you have access to right now. And shame on you if you don't at least learn it. Don't be intimidated by the lingo. I know that this conversation has honed that in for me that I need to be responsible that when I geek out, I'm geeking out about the crypto and the web three and the communities and the technology. But when I'm talking about wealth building, I need to make sure I compartmentalize these conversations because people can't get it that these worlds cross, you know? <laughs> yeah. And once again, these are just things that you and I take for granted because we now talk, I'd say almost once a week and we yeah. geek out and we're throwing across four or five different sectors and industries in yeah. any two sentences and you yeah. and I get it, but <laughs> some people are like looking for a dictionary and, or they've stopped listening. I just love the way you sold Bitcoin there. You're like, what if there's going to be 21 metric tons yeah. of this new thing? And Apple's going to use it. Google's going to use it. Mm -hmm. The United States government's going to buy it. Yep. Wouldn't you buy 1%? Wouldn't you put make 1% of your portfolio be that? Having Correct. some exposure yeah. Yeah. just in the event that it does hit and it does go up 100x, well, yeah. then you've doubled your portfolio. I think that one of the things I, I actually want to say, because you mentioned Bitcoin and gold, and Bitcoin and gold are so similar in but they're also so different. And the two big differences are the things you've already touched upon, which is the supply. Yeah. The other thing is its ability across time and its ability across space. Now, the reason why we went to a fiat standard is when we started having all of this gold and we can't transfer gold. I can't come and give you gold. Gold is not easy to transfer. It doesn't break down easily. So what we did was we left the gold in the banks and then we just started trading paper amongst mm -hmm. us and we traded yep. notes and notes is debt. So across time, gold is great because it will continue to appreciate yeah. across 10 years. But across space, mm -hmm. if you're in Delhi, India, mm -hmm. and I'm in Panama City, Panama, I can't send you gold easily. Even today, it would just mm -hmm. be, it's kind of a quagmire if I have gold and I want to send it to you. Mm -hmm. So that is where Bitcoin wins, the space argument. Interesting. Because uh, you can, the time and space, you know, yeah, whereas dollars, mm -hmm. fiat currency is really good across space, but across time, we know it's going to depreciate. Whereas Jeez. gold wow. across time will appreciate, but across space, it's brutal. Bitcoin is both of those. And mm -hmm. I just wanted to go and I really wanted to make sure that this was on the recording. Yeah. One of the reasons why I was so fascinated by, before I changed Wi-Fi and water into the now rebranded more than blockchain podcast, mm -hmm. I think that crypto and I think the climate crisis are very fascinating because I think I see them as one and the same. Because, yeah, they're similar. Yeah, because the UN saying, you know, 50 million people are going to be displaced annually 
yeah. as we move into the future because of the climate crisis. Well, when these people leave, they're not putting gold in their pockets. What's the easiest thing for them to do? Yeah. It's to figure out a way to buy Bitcoin, put yeah. that up there, memorize their seed phrase, yeah. and then go wherever they need to go. Get in that yeah. raft. Get run run away from whatever that violence is happening. Which is you know, happening run away in Ukraine. Yes, which is happening in Ukraine. People are starting to store yes. their economic energy in Bitcoin because they're like, you know what? If I have to leave with a shirt on my back, this is going to change everything. And I just yeah. think as humans continue to have to migrate and to have to change their location due to the climate, yeah. they're going to look for the best thing that they need when they are going to have to travel. And yes. you're not going to want to carry dollars with you. Sure, you're going to have some dollars to be able to facilitate some you know, things, but you're going to put your family savings in Bitcoin. And Man. I don't see that ever changing. And so when you think about gold and Bitcoin, you have to think about Bitcoin is time and space and yeah. gold is just time. Fiat is space, but Bitcoin is both. So let me ask you this. More than blockchain, you are a Bitcoin maximalist. Where are you going with the show? Like, what do you hope people get from it? Or do you have a vision for the show? Yeah, so... Bitcoin maximalist, like I said, I'm a Bitcoin maximalist in theory, but not in practice because it's still less than 4% of my portfolio. But by 2026, that will not be the case. I mean, okay. I, I'm actively creating my strategy right now in this bear market to, as we would say, sweep some floors pretty seriously. Yes. Uh, and I'm stacking up fiat to be able to make a good entry. We hang that. up, and, I have a whole buy list. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you know, check our, check our Twitters. More than blockchain, I really, <clears throat> I haven't really talked about what I want it to be. And I was thinking the other day, and I think the podcast is really cool. I like creating podcasts. I like having these guests. And I was texting with one last night, this guy, Brandon Torrey, he's doing an amazing thing. He's, I call him, you know, he's gonna be like the new Sean Parker, the way that he's trying to reconfigure the way that we access music. And if oh, you haven't cool. listened to that episode, I would check it out. I mean, he's, he's really doing it. You know, sometimes I've, you know, myself included, I still have not created my web three or my crypto project as a builder. I'm really just creating content around the space. And I'm going to start to do that as a builder with my NFTs that will be guest only exclusive NFTs. So there's that element. Yeah. And so that way all the guests will come in and there'll be a network and I want to have a discord and I want to really create a connection because I know that there's going to be so much synergy among these people that yes. are going to be part of my community. Mm -hmm. And so that's one thing. I just see more than blockchain becoming a bigger brand and I want it to, I want to grow the brand. And this is the first time I'm actually going to share this. So if you hear this, you're like, wow, that's kind of crazy. Let's do it. I'll wear the shirt. Yeah, exactly. So there's going to be merch. It's going to be swag. And I'm working right now to find a environmentally friendly uh, source of shirts. Cause I don't just want to go to a place and just kind of have them done. It doesn't align with me. Uh, and I don't think it speaks to like where I, where I see the world going and stuff. So I want to have merch. I want to really turn it into kind of like a media brand. Mm. I'm building a library of PDFs that are like from Goldman Sachs, from Bank of America, mm. from financial institutions, from now crypto thought, think tanks as a way for people. Because I think a lot of people are like, oh, okay, like Bitcoin. All right. You've talked to me about it. I've listened to your podcast. I don't believe it. I'm, I want you to go onto more than blockchain.xyz. And I want you to go to what I'm going to call the learning library mm -hmm. where you're going to be able to have, you know, on the website, you'll have access to podcasts that I'll do. You'll have access to these PDFs that aren't going to be mine, at least right now. I'm not going to create my own, but there'll be a comp compilation of these huge institutions that are saying, yeah, all right, our high net worth investors, you know, Bank of America has to stay in front of this. Otherwise, they're going to lose people and they need to look like the SMEs or the subject matter experts or they're going to look fools. So I want people to go on. If they don't believe me, that's fine but you might believe Bank of America. So go check out more than blockchain.xyz and check out the learning library. And I'm building that right now, but I really want it to be a media company and I want to have it in both English and Spanish. That's my challenge to myself. So I want to have the PDFs. I want to have this huge library that's going to continue to grow as more and more information comes out. I want podcasts for the audio. So you have the audio you have, you know, you can go read. I need to start doing videos. I want to do short, short, content and put it up on TikTok and also on YouTube, mm -hmm. the, the one minute things, just super sick, super quick bites. And then I want to hire people probably in India, just due to the language and the geo arbitrage. I want to find a couple guys, a couple girls, a couple people that are really into crypto. Yeah. And I want to stake them and be like, I'm going to pay you X amount of money. And you're going to write me a blog every day, mm -hmm. you know, Monday through Friday, you're going to write me a blog and I'm going to pay you. And it's going to be great because we're going to do some geo arbitrage here. So I'm going to, I'm going to get a deal you're going to get paid three or four yeah. times what you normally get paid. And now we're going to be, you know, you're going to help me build more than blockchain and probably figure out some kind of a rev share thing with NFTs there. I haven't totally done it, but I really yeah. want to grow 
more than blockchain because it's such a nascent space. It's just so new and there's not enough. Yeah. There's not, there's not like these big brands that are out there. So I really want the podcast to be one element mm. of a much bigger play, but I'm hoping over the next six months to kind of really roll these things out. I just rolled the website out. I'm mm. going to have merch launching soon. I'm going to get the guest exclusive NFT in the next. I'm going to have the learning library up there, which I'm really excited for because I do think that people over 40 and I hate to put an age on it, but over 40 or honestly over 30, because once you have once you have, I think, a home, if you're a homeowner or you have a child, I think you become a lot more conservative overnight about the risk you're going to take. Yeah. And so I want to break down those barriers. Maybe listen to my podcast. You may not get that, but please go listen, you know, go read the stuff that BlackRock just put out about it, right? Go read this stuff that uh, MicroStrategy, right. Mike, Michael Saylor just wrote about and his conviction because he's also, you know, walking the talk. Yeah. So that's really where I see more than blockchain going. It's going to be much more than a podcast. And ideally yeah. it goes all the way down to, I'm able to go and travel and continue to have conversations with people in my travels. Because I just yeah. think the other cool thing about Web3 and crypto is that this touches upon everybody. Yes, because everyone this, will be affected by it. Everyone will be affected. And so telling the stories that maybe people don't think is they're like, oh, it's just for crypto bros. Oh, it's just for Lambo bros who are out in San Francisco. That's actually not what this looks like. And I was just in New Orleans and recorded an episode with a guy who's doing crazy stuff. But like, he's like, yeah, New Orleans is definitely on the Web3 map and we're going to continue to make it that way. Yeah. You know, so the decentralized geographically too is super fun for me. Yeah. Well, let me ask this question, then I'll let you go because you and I could just, you know what, stay here for the weekend and talk <laughs> through this shit. What, what's the best way for some rube to say, okay, I'm going to start thinking about acquiring 1% of my portfolio. What is like the most sublimely simple way you would onboard somebody? Well, this is, uh, so I'm going to give advice that I haven't taken myself, which I am not a fan of but I need to actually just go do this. There is Swan Bitcoin, and this is probably the easiest way to dollar cost average or buy into Bitcoin monthly, which I just think that you should probably do. Unless you have a bunch of capital on the side and you can put in 1% just all in one, and you know it's at 30,000 and you know it's gonna go to a million, or at least you believe that storyline and you've looked at the stats that we've shown here. I thought the video of you showing the supply and the potential demand was just unbelievable. I would say looking into Swan Bitcoin, you can set up an account and then you can just start buying Bitcoin. I have a buddy who buys $10 a day. How do That's you spell it. that? I don't even know this resource. Swan, S-W-A-N, Bitcoin.com. S-W-A-N-B-I-T-C-O-I-N.com. So that is what most of my friends use to buy Bitcoin in shorter ink, smaller increments. So if you just want to, like I said, my buddy gets $10 a day. I have people that get like $100 a week. Whatever your threshold is, I have a buddy who gets a couple thousand a month. I personally buy monthly, so I don't do the daily. But if you're looking to, Swan has some of the best and it's just for Bitcoin. And Interesting. Why yeah, Swan instead of just like Coinbase? It has, uh, Swan has much better fees. Oh. Coinbase has crazy fees. I'll check uh, that out. Yeah, and I think Coinbase, and I'm not... I think Coinbase is trying to do way too much. And I think they're going to continue to try to do way too much. And I don't think that that's going to serve them over the short term. Over the long term, maybe they'll get away with it because they have so much liquidity and they're like, do have profit. But I think just trying to be the premier exchange is where they should try to stay. Now they're trying to introduce NFTs. I think they're overstepping and I'm interested to see what they try to do in lending in the future. But anyway, getting away from that, swan swanbitcoin.com is probably a great place. And also just, you know, feel free to reach out to me. So more than blockchain.xyz is the website. Man. And yeah. from there, you can get all the episodes and see stuff. And I'll be starting to throw up, as I said, the merch, the learning library, yeah. some of the other big philosophies I have about where I really want uh, the brand to go. So yeah, yeah. man. Well, to the public watching, I don't have to tell you that you've got to follow Jarrett. I know I will. He's brilliant. Thanks for being on the show, man. I really appreciate you. And you know we're probably going to be doing this so regularly. So check back in if you want to get more of this or just follow More Than Blockchain. And I follow him both on Twitter. I follow his website. Check it out. Thanks so much, Jarrett. Thanks so much.